Uh, my name is Joe. I'm from uh, China. Uh, so um, I want to ask, how do you um, feel about the huge copyright issue in China, like illegal copies of software? Well, I'm in Tepper School of Business, so. Well, the, the issue of you know, how intellectual property should be priced, that's gonna, it's a big issue. It's going to be around uh, for a long time. You know, I'm sure people get my vaccines. Uh, they don't notice. Say, ooh, thank God somebody paid for software. Uh, but uh, <laughs> when I started Microsoft, uh, the first big uh, sort of thing I got known for amongst all these, uh, it was, nobody was in this business, but there were these computer clubs. And I'd go around and visit the computer clubs. And I'd left the paper tape around, and so somebody took it and copied it. Uh, so my first letter was called an open letter to hobbyists that said, hey, come on, you guys, quit ripping off my paper tapes. Uh, if you don't pay for this stuff, we can't write anymore. And that was my first and last you know, kind of outraged emotional statement about copyright violation. <laughs> Based on the response to that, I decided, oh, you, you never, uh, being upset about it is never effective. And, you know, for some products, you just have to figure out what the price is uh, that it's going to be attractive to the market. Sometimes you can do that, sometimes you can't. China, if you compared, if you said at a certain level of wealth, people stop copying software and, said, oh, and compared that about across various countries, the richer country is the less copying there is. It doesn't drop to zero. You know, maybe there's some people here who have music they didn't pay for, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it drops, particularly in business use, it drops. And in individual use, it never drops to zero. But what's unique to China is you have large businesses using software without paying for it. Super profitable large businesses. You know, take two of the five most profitable businesses in China. They don't pay for their software. So that's pretty. That's a case where the Chinese have done something quite unique. Uh, but uh, I'm not complaining about it. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of China. Uh, and a lot of great things going on there. Uh, but you know, we've all got things to work on. Uh, we have time for one more question. Sure. Hi, my name is Kevin. I'm a sophomore in the School of Computer Science. I first want to thank you and the Hillman Foundation for giving us a new home. Um, so this question is from online. A lot of people wanted to ask about your philanthropy. So what is your opinion on modern philanthropy, uh, philanthropy today? Do you think it's harder to get people to donate, or, especially in the light of the uh, current economic state, or do you think it's actually a lot easier? Well, I definitely think that it's tougher uh, since the financial crisis to get people to donate. Now, the, it's fantastic that the drop-off has been less than I would have expected. If you'd given me this scenario of how much, how tough things have been, I would have predicted more drop-off. But it's a very tough situation for a lot of foundations because they have two sources of income. One is the current donations, and those have dropped off, uh, and the other is that they often will have their endowment uh, in varying degrees in the stock market. And so of the top 20 foundations in the US, the average loss in the uh, corpus uh, was about 28% uh, over a one year period. We lost 20%, so we're really smart. Uh, uh, and now a lot of them have gained some of that back, but, but nowhere near all of it. So you have both your your corpus that you expected to increase. You, people were kind of spoiled by a lot of years there with that. Well, you know, is it up 5% this year or 15%? And you particularly had a thing where there was this jealousy effect, which happens in many systems, where people looked at the returns that Yale and Harvard had as they were using exotic things. Well, those guys actually got incredibly above normal returns for the exotic things they did because they saw them before other people. Then as other people rushed in, take Timberland, Timberland got ridiculously mispriced, but it was a faddish thing where that had worked for Harvard. 
at one price and it was going to be a disaster for the other. So you had both this lemming effect uh, and the market as a whole uh, being a problem. And so you had a lot of uh, foundations, including uh, some at educational institutions, where they really what was hurt. Uh, I didn't study the CMU figures uh, and had to cut back. So these are, these are tough times for foundations and they're trying you know, they're not used to having to cut back, and some are actually being pretty smart about it uh, and everything. Now, as, as the U.S. economy is going to come back, it could take a while. You know, people like to talk about the shape of the recovery, but this country will keep creating wealth. Why will it keep creating wealth? Because of the things we've been talking about, the, the new medicines and robots, and, you know, which country is by far going to be doing these innovations for the future. Our share of innovation may not be, you know, what it was in 1948, say, at the end of World War II, but it's still extremely high. China's increasing its share, which is a great thing for the world. The more innovation there is, you know, when you get a life-saving drug, you don't say too many times, say, where was that made again? Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're going to get back on a good track. And so I think philanthropy will get back on a good track. And one of the things I like to do is, is share with other people how much fun I'm having uh, giving the money away, you know, trying to make sure it's not, not misspent. And, uh, you know, with the, the subtext of, boy, I'd love to have, have more join in. Thank you very much.